So Father, we pray, God, in the name of Jesus, you would just have the right of way. Lord, you see every circumstance, every situation. You see every need tonight in the name of Jesus. Lord, will you move this day and give you glory, honor, and praise. Answer somebody's questions. Give solution to somebody's dilemma. In the mighty name of Jesus. Father, I thank you because I sense your presence. I thank you because your glory is among us. In Jesus' name we pray. People of God say amen. Amen. The book of Galatians chapter 4. Book of Galatians chapter 4. We praise God again for being here. We have an opportunity to come and to give a praise just one more time. Earlier we shared, they just shared it through the church's website. Um, that it has been one year. August 4th makes one year of Sunday night praise. Yes, sir. We praise God. Amen. That has given us continuance and allowing us just to keep on coming together. Hallelujah. And I praise God for that every promise of God is true. Hallelujah. And I praise God for his word even on earlier today. Galatians chapter 4. I want to look at uh, verse 2. I'm going to read some other scriptures as well. Uh, and I'll get them all out the way because I know how we are in the church nowadays. If we don't read all the scriptures in the beginning, nobody wants to open their Bible again in the middle of the message. Amen. People get nervous. They have to start all over again. Okay, so let's take a look at these scriptures now and then we'll get right into the word of God. Galatians chapter 4. Amen. I'll start at verse 1. It says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant. Though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. In the Daniel chapter 10, verse 1 says, you can just write these down. In the third year of Sirius, King of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true. But the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing and had understanding of the vision. If I were underlining in my Bible, I would underline the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And then from Genesis chapter 18, verse 14, it says, Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee. According to the time of life, and Sarah shall have the son. And then I remember Job's words as he spoke. He said, if a man die, in Job chapter 14, verse 14, he said, if a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Then Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. Familiar passage of the scripture for many of us. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3 it says, For the vision is yet for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. And then from Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, my final scripture, I promise you that I will read in your hearing. It says, And let us not be weary in well doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And I just want to encourage somebody in the house of God tonight to tell your neighbor, if you would, due season is the right season. is the right season. Due season is the right season. God bless you. You can be seated. I'm praying again. Father, I thank you. Thank you for what we need. God, speak unto us. Give us clarity to revelation and insight in Jesus' name. Open up the windows of prophecy. Allow us to hear you clearly. In Jesus' name we pray. People of God say amen. amen. We live in a very interesting time. We live in a time where we, 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 people are struggling with the notion of faith. People are struggling. Though we are greater faith deliverance ministries does not exempt us from our own faith experiences. And faith, many of us know, for those who picked up Webster's Dictionary, you know, that's, that's the preacher's dictionary, you know, Webster's Dictionary, um, 
uh, defines faith uh, with two prongs. Uh, but most of us, when we think of faith, we think of that first part of the definition that has to do with belief. But where many of us struggle is not in the area of believing what God says. But we struggle in that second prong that says trust. Yeah. And so faith is a combination not only of belief, but it's a compound expression of both faith, belief, and trust. And so while it is easy for some of us to hear a word that comes from God, and to express belief in the words that we have heard, sometimes we definitely struggle in the area of trust. In fact, it's very interesting that as you begin to peruse the life of this man who is called Abraham, one of the first things that Abraham says regarding him when he hears what God says to him, it says, and Abraham believed God. Yes, sir. Anybody ever been in a situation where you heard God, you knew that it was God, but you did not move with doubt, with fear or unbelief, but you believed what you heard. And I bless God for the testimony of Abraham who had the nerve, who had the spiritual integrity to be able to just believe God and to take him at his word. But don't you know that something very interesting begins to happen when you believe God? Something very interesting begins to happen. Time happens when you believe God. Circumstances happen when you believe God. If I were just to use my imagination for the couple of moments to which I am alive this evening, I would imagine that when God spoke to Abram and told him that he was going to bring forth a son, that Abram likely began to get excited. That he began to perhaps tell neighbors that although I've had a long journey without producing that one single child, God has spoken to me. And he believes God so much that perhaps he began to tell people all in the neighborhood, perhaps he might say by this time next year I'm going to see the fulfillment of what God has spoken to me. I shared with my wife at some point that when I began to consider the life of Abraham, perhaps there were many that were in his generation that had already had children. Many that had already had the benefit of having kids that were growing up. Some perhaps were getting ready to have their last children. You know how there's that last tag along that cut. Perhaps there were a couple of unexpected surprises that began to come along with those that were in his generation. And perhaps when he heard this word from God, there was the mindset that although I wasn't able to start out with them, at least I'll be able to have a child that can grow up on the tail end of some of my friends and my loved ones, the people with whom I am acquainted. And so he begins to hear this word, to hear this promise, and his faith is not without works. For we know that he is instructed in the text that he has to lead behind of his father's house, his country, his kindred, and his father's house. And he goes to a land not knowing where he's going, but a land that God would show him. It's that belief on today. And as he begins his journey and believes God, year after year passes. And I can imagine that perhaps in the first year, probably when it did not happen or transpire, perhaps he begins to examine within himself, what could I do differently in order for this to come to pass? Maybe there's something on this, or maybe it wasn't this year, maybe it's next year. And year number two and three and four begin to pass, and frustration begins to set in when God gives you a promise. Anybody a witness that Abraham had already begun to acclimate his life to living without the promise? He had learned how to be content, and now his expectations have been raised, and he comes year upon year expecting not only him, but perhaps his community as well, looking to see when it is that God is going to do what he said he would do. At some point, I'd imagine that the, the, as the time begins to go on and Abraham begins to get a little, little bit older, that he begins to become concerned. If I'm going to have the son, I ought to be able to enjoy the son that I have. You don't hear me because you're too spiritual and you don't know what it is to begin to calculate and begin to say, all right, God, I hear that you've got a promise for me, but what good is a promise if I'm not going to get to enjoy it? What good is the promise if I'm never going to get to experience the fullness of what you have for me? It's good that you promised this, but if you wait too long, I'm going to be too old. And so desperation begins to cry. And I can imagine that perhaps by now, Sarah beginning to ask herself, well, maybe it's me. Maybe God has a plan for you. And maybe I'm just getting in the way of the plan. Let me step out of the way because I know how much this means to you. 
but I do have a servant girl, and her name is Hagar. Why don't you go in to her, and God can fulfill his promise with me out of the way, and she begins to believe the lie of the adversary, that God needed to use somebody outside of their marital union in order for him to bring about his word and cause it to come to pass. Can I tell you that time, that the difficulty of time can bring desperation, the difficulty of time can bring frustration. And so now, in this what appears to be entering in to the 12th year, entering in on the 12th year, now all of a sudden, Abraham and Hagar produced an Ishmael, and now the expectation is that finally God has revealed his word and revealed his promise. Life is going good until God begins to speak again. And now God comes back to Abraham and says, I see what you did. I see how you calculated. I see how it made sense to you. But maybe you didn't hear me the first time, but my promise is I'm going to do it through you and through Sarah. And this is frustrating because now we've already experienced this for about 12 years. 12 years of believing and seeing nothing. 12 years of expecting and seeing nothing. Do you know how frustrating it is to believe God's word to look and to see nothing? How can you people looking at you like you're crazy? Because you said, does says the Lord? And you still continue to see absolutely nothing? In fact, I can imagine that then, how in Abraham's mind, especially when God comes back the second time and says, at the appointed time, here I come, but I'm going to cause the word of God to come to pass. Don't most of us think it would be easier? Why didn't God just wait till year 24? Why tell me in year number one? to tell me this promise. I could have been a little bit more patient and God delayed his word. But this is where we begin to understand that God's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And he begins to articulate for us in Genesis that as long as the earth remains, there will be two things. One of them is called seed time and the second one is called harvest. And yet God, whenever he creates Thing. He always declares the end from the beginning. So I can imagine in the mind of God that God exhaled and there was Isaiah. But God exhaled. He released the word and the word of the seed called Isaiah. But God in his infinite wisdom knew that the generation of this word would take 25 years in the soil called Abraham. And so God looks at the time period and they go and speaks to Abraham and says, Abraham, this is the promise that I have for you. I want to preach to somebody that may feel frustrated, somebody that might feel annoyed, but the time period of God, I want you to know and understand that God knows just how long it takes for that seed to germinate and produce fruit in your life. God knows how long he has to work. Yeah.
It's gonna be right. Hallelujah. It's gonna be right back to life. Hallelujah. I believe. How do you believe that on tonight? Come on, praise God like you believe. Hallelujah. 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 I wish you believe it right on tonight. Come on, church. 